Welcome back to the show. My guest today is Fran Rashopi. Fran spent 13 years in the U.S. Army, a good portion of that in special operations. Um, I won't even get into all, Fran, you're, you're involved in absolutely everything. So I'm not going to go down a litany of lists of things that you're involved in. You're an entrepreneur. Not uh, everything. There's so many more <laughs> things I want to be involved in that I'm like totally incapable of doing and unqualified for. Those well, are the I, things I really want to do. No, no, it's not the unqualified part, bro. I just, I, I look at your schedule, bro. And I think that I just don't, you don't have enough hours in the day, bro. So that's, that's no, the, there's uh, never enough hours in the day. So, but, but you are also involved. You grew up on the water. Uh, you are the performance coach for Boston University, the rowing club. Um, you also are involved uh, uh, in an organization called Sail Ahead, which is uh, a veteran organization dealing with the water. So then I have to ask the obvious question, why the U.S. Army? You, why not the Navy? <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. My dad, my dad wanted me to go to the air force actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was like super disappointed when I said I was going to go in the army. He's like, well, what do you mean? You can go fly airplanes. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not fun. <laughs> you know, you're like still, and then he was like, okay, well, when you go in the army, you can go be a helicopter pilot right. because it was like all in the flying. He's like, and then I said, well, that's cool too. But like, I don't know. You're still kind of like a taxi driver. And I say that and I'm like, I'm backing into saying that because all of the people are going to be so mad at me I was gonna say who are helicopter that. pilots who listen. And we did on the pot on the Jedberg podcast, we did an interview with Clay Hotmacher, okay. General Clay Hotmacher, <laughs> right. who's was the commander of the 160th. And, um, and he actually references that, that like their, their job is to get you, get the operator from one place to another. I was just going to say, but I wanted to be the operator on the ground. <laughs> especially your job. You dealt with the, with the best pilots on earth, man. So they, they would probably have something to say about that. I was just going to say. No, tons, tons of respect for, yeah. for them. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't do anything without them. So, and they can do a job that I would never be able to do. And so it's absolutely world changing organization in the 160th and that's the that's kind of what we talk about on, in that conversation but anyway why i go in the army i went in the army because i was a journalism major and i wanted to be the next tom brokaw okay and if anyone knows tom brokaw and can introduce me please do because i still want to interview him but <laughs> tom brokaw he was my hero he was the guy who was like on the news every night on nbc on the nightly news and i felt like he was changing the world and I felt like he was so impactful showing everybody. This was before the days of com commentary journalism. Right. It was objective. Everything was objective. And he was reporting the news. I studied it. I was a broadcast journalism major. And then 9-11 was my junior year. Then I saw these guys with beards, long hair. They were riding horses. They, yeah. in my mind, were saving the world. We went into Afghanistan. We went into Iraq. And I saw what Special Forces was doing. I was rowing at the time. So I didn't do ROTC. And then I said, well, being a journalist is cool, but I'd have to move to like Bangor, Maine. I don't think I really want to do that and work like three jobs in order to sustain myself. But I could go be impactful now. And if I want to be a journalist, I can do that later on. And so I said, well, I'm going to go in the Army and I'm going to figure out a way to one day become a Green Beret. Okay, so you, that was the plan from jump because obviously there's a lot of stages to get to the Green Beret. Um, first of all, how'd your family feel about it? Uh, you mentioned <laughs> your dad, but how'd your mom, whatever they react to that? You know, I, I didn't really talk to anybody about it. I kind of just was like, this is what I was going to do. And, and I'm not, um, I, I gotten better in my older years now about uh, seeking other people's input and being a little less focused on solely what I want, mm -hmm. but it was, it was very much like, this is what I'm going to do. There's not really anything else that I'm interested in right now. And, uh, that was it. I'm going down to the recruiter. I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to go to officer candidate school. That was the application that I put in and was accepted for. And you know, my mom, I don't really ever remember really talking to her about it. Mm -hmm. I talked to my dad and we just talked about the different service branches. And then one day I came home and was like, Hey, I got accepted officer candidate school in the army. And this is when I start. That's it. Um, and so you, you're originally from, uh, you're from the Northeast, uh, still there now. Um, so where, where's your first stop at when you, once you, you graduate from BU, um, and then what, what's, do you immediately get commissioned? Cause it's OCS. What, what happens there? Yeah, I was, so I was born in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. There's only a few of us who've been born in Rhode Island, but every once in a while you come across from one. Uh, but that was where that was where I was born to spend a little bit of time growing up in Florida. We lived in Miami 
when I was in like the early 90s. So if you know anything about Miami in the early 90s, it was a pretty wild place to be. Our apartment that we lived in was right on Brickle Key in downtown Miami. It had been seized by the DEA. <laughs> my parents are my parents are builders. So okay. they were like, well, we can fix the walls where the where the DEA put holes in it to get the <laughs> drugs out. That's cool. But it was awesome. <laughs> like and, LA in the so, 90s as well, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, you know, super formative years, you know, like early, late, late elementary school, early middle school. So I loved growing up there for a couple of years. And then when we moved back up north, we moved to outside of Boston to a town called Weston, went to Weston High, and then went to Boston University. And after I graduated, I did, I went straight to officer candidate school. So basic training officer candidate school was branch infantry, which was my number one choice. I had aviation as we talked about mm -hmm. and at my dad's recommendation. And then the day they were like, Hey, you need to switch. If you want to make any changes, today's the day, then we're submitting your packet. And I said, yeah, I want to put infantry number one. And I remember the recruiter being like, are you sure? <laughs> like, yeah, man, I'm sure. Well, Every once in a while in life, you get exactly what you ask yeah, for. I was gonna say, and, <laughs> it doesn't happen often in that process, but right. yeah, right? And, yeah, and I was I was branched infantry, and so I went to uh, the infantry officer basic course. I went to ranger school. I went to I went to airborne school. Then I was sent to Fort Carson, Colorado, to be part of the Third Brigade, Fourth Infantry Division. And so I went to a couple courses on the Bradley Fighting Vehicle, and then that was it. Yeah, I was there. Platoon leader day one showing up at my unit in fourth ID. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, a constant theme in your life now, and I'm assuming part of your whole life. Uh, your dad, your parents were entrepreneurs, obviously, as you just said. So leadership, you talk a lot about that on your podcast, and I didn't mention that you did Jed Bird podcast as well. We'll get into that um, performance at, at a high level, and then your army career is performance at a high level. So. Um, what are the lessons that you're getting early on in that army career? Because when I talk to a lot of uh, people that get to where you got in the army, Green Beret, whatever else, they say a lot of the formative leadership experiences they got were pretty early on, whether it was, you know, jump school, ranger, whatever. What, what, what was it for you and what were you seeing at that time that impacted you? I agree with that. Um, I think that your first couple of years in service are certainly formative by who you who you work with who's around you probably shapes you and the opportunities that you have mm -hmm. i was i was very fortunate i'm, I'm an all or nothing guy mm -hmm. meaning like if i'm going to do something i'm going to do it to the best of my ability and i'm going to do it right right um or i'm not going to do it at all right and when i went into the army i was very much like that i had come out of rowing so i immediately the day rowing was over was like okay now I have to train to go into the army. And so I bought Stu Smith's books. Uh, there were like no, there were no books on like going into the army right. or being a green beret. Right. There were books on becoming a Navy seal. Right. See, and now all the, now all the seals who I make fun of all the time are going to be like, ah, oh, I knew it. <laughs> but, and I've talked to Stu Smith since actually we're going to have him on the podcast. Oh, nice, and I told nice. him like your books were like actually formative for me because the end of my, my career in rowing ended right before my senior spring season which is like the culmination because i ended up having having to have elbow surgery okay. um due to a, a a fractured nerve um and where i lost the use of my the outside of my my hand and uh <laughs> and so i was like well now i have to train my body to go to the army and what does that look like and i said so i bought this book you know it was like six 14 weeks to but 12 weeks to buds right. i think right. it was like a right. four week pre thing that you do so it's like 16 weeks and i did this whole thing and was in phenomenal shape when I went to the army and I go to basic training and it's like evident day one that I was completely overtrained. <laughs> um, when I was like beating people by like minutes in the runs, you know, to the, to the point that like the drill sergeants are like, you know, you're, they're adding time to my Slow run. Down. I'm like arguing <laughs> yeah, with them, right. you know? And they're like, no, that's not your time. I'm like, I remember that I got yelled at. It was like one of the, cause I, I didn't know anything. It was like the second or third day of basic training and we finished this run and there's like no one near me. There's like one or two other guys who were near me who were also OCS guys mm -hmm. who had played like soccer, um, you know, phenomenal shape guys. And they're like, they give me my time. And it was like a minute slower than I knew I ran. Mm -hmm. And so I immediately look at them cause I'm you know, still basically a civilian and I'm like, ah, that's not possible. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> and they're like, what did you say to me? Right, and they're all in my face screaming. And I'm like, uh, nothing, you're absolutely right. My type sucked, I'm horrible. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like, in my head, I'm like, there's absolutely no way that's my time. I know my splits down to like the hundred, down to like the hundred meter mark right. for a two mile run. Right. But, but I, <coughs> sorry, no I swallowed wrong, but I go, but you know, I, 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 I get there and I start to have these series of experiences when I get to my unit, which really started from my first day at the unit mm -hmm. and it would be one, eight infantry, which is part of third brigade, fourth ID. And the unit was getting ready to go to Iraq. Okay. Um, we had about six months. Um, so it was like early summer when I arrived there and it was going to be November, December, we were deploying to Iraq. Okay. The unit had just gotten back from Iraq. They were in the initial uh, invasion and I showed up and my battalion commander had just taken command a guy named Jeff Martindale. I'm still close to him until this day. He had come out of Ranger battalion, whole Korean Ranger battalion. And I show up and he takes me to his office and he says, do you want to be a platoon leader? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. You know, that's why I came here. I'm very excited to be in the infantry. And he's like, well, you were the honor graduate at Ranger School. You know, like, yeah, yes, sir. And he's like, okay, great. Well, here's what I'm doing. I'm firing every platoon leader in this battalion who doesn't have a Ranger tab. You're the first guy who's come to this battalion with a Ranger tab. So that process starts today. Let's go down and meet your company and meet your platoon. And I'm like, uh, you know, and I'm like not even thinking, you know, more than two steps ahead. I'm just like, sweet, I'm getting a platoon because everyone tells you, you know, you're going to go to your unit, you're going to sit on staff, you know, and I'm like, I don't even know what staff is, but now this guy's telling me I'm going to be a platoon leader. So we go, we walk through the whole battalion area, and we go down into the company and we walk in the door and he opens the door, he walks in and the whole, everybody stands up, you know, oh, yes, sir, you know, battalion commander, yes, sir. And I'm standing there, you know, brand new, brand new, like my beret, like doesn't even fit right. And, you know, my, my, my gold butter bar, you know, second lieutenant stuff is like all shiny. And this guy comes up and it's a first lieutenant. And he, the battalion commander looks around and he says, you, you're fired. You take his job and walks out. Points to you, says you're taking his job. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, he's gone. And he's gone. And I'm like, uh, hi. <laughs> right. It's like, how, how are you? It's like something out of a comedy, man. Of a movie. And, and this is how it starts. This kicks off my, my career. So needless to say, the, the transition with this guy was as cordial uh, as it could be, obviously, because he, he understood that like, this wasn't really my doing. But that was it. I mean, that was it. And the the battalion commander systematically from that point forward went through the every lieutenant in the battalion and gave them the choice. Go to ranger school, pass, keep your, keep your platoon. Go to ranger school, don't pass, lose your platoon. Don't go to ranger school, lose your platoon. That was it. Those are the, only, those are the choices. And that's what he did. And I will tell you that when we went to our, when we went to Iraq in November of two thousand five, everybody had a ranger tab. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, they you're did. not gonna get busted down. That was a lesson to everybody. Good grief, man. Um, yeah, but that was formative. Yeah, yeah. And about standards, about standards, about standards, right? And then also having to, I mean, anybody that's ever been in management, man, having to deliver hard news in front of a lot of people, uh, that's a tricky proposition as well. As I'm. You know, you're in your civilian life now. You've got to make those decisions now, and I'm sure that's a, you know, that's a tough that's a tough call for anybody to make. You know. Well, I wouldn't have handled the um, trend. I wouldn't have handled the delivery of the news in that manner. Right. right. <laughs> but but he was proving a point. You know, and and I understand it. You know, in retrospect, and and I think it was. For, I think it worked. We were going to a very difficult area of Iraq. He knew that, and he knew that the unit was only going to be as effective as the core of second lieutenants. And and that there is a really important point because we tend to put a lot of stake on senior senior yeah. leadership, general, CEOs, you know, majors, colonels, VPs, SVPs, you know, managers. But at the end of the day, the rubber meets the road in organizations at the execution mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. And at the subordinate leader level mm -hmm. that team leader squad leader in the army the platoon leader you know and then special forces your detachment commander 
They're the ones who are on the ground every day. Every organization is built like this. Mm -hmm. you know, corporate organizations are built the same way. The people who execute the work sit towards the bottom of that hierarchical pyramid. Mm -hmm. And we often put so much stake in the people at the top because they have to be well-led. You, you have to be well-led. You have to have the vision. You have to have the clarity of thought. You have to have the mission, the direction. That all stems from the top and resource management and all that stuff. But if you don't have competent leaders who can go out there and execute and lead their teams effectively where the rubber meets the road, you cannot be a successful organization. And he understood that. He understood the mission we had, the fight we were going into, and he said, my unit needs a certain type of leader at this junior most level to be successful in this environment. Right. And he had the courage to make that change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you were going into a dangerous neighborhood for sure. And speaking of that, um, 2005, as if those of us that were around at that time remember, that it was kicking off heavy at that time in Iraq. Um, What's your what's your mindset going into Iraq, and where's your first stop? Where do you go? Fear, fear, yeah, fear, yeah. fear. And, and anyone who <clears throat> says that they're they're not scared is full of shit. Um, I just don't. I just I, I don't buy it. Um, yeah, absolute fear. Uh, it was was what I felt. You know, we landed in. Uh, you go to Kuwait, you sit there for for a while. It's it's hot and horrible. Um. Even though it was like November, you're still like, oh my God, I'm dying. And uh, and then we flew into um, to Balad, to, to the airfield in Balad, um, Camp Anaconda. And, uh, you know, the C-17 does the whole, you know, spiral down and, and you land and it was like, oh my God. You know, and, I mean, I'm a second lieutenant. I've never been to combat, you know, I, well, but much of my platoon had been okay. to combat. Okay. All of my squad leaders had been to Iraq or Afghanistan. My platoon sergeant had been in the army for like 17 years at that point. He was in the first was Gulf the first War. Half, yeah. He had already been to Iraq in a previous deployment. They were they were absolutely phenomenal. I, I mean, they were experienced. I still talk to them, a lot of the guys to this day, awesome. because they were so influential on me. And it made being... It made being a junior leader who had the, the ultimate authority in on the platoon so much easier because I could trust them. I could trust their experience. I could trust their capability. And I knew that we would be successful if my job was not to tell them what to do, but my job was to give empower them to be the best leaders that they could be. And that's something that I've carried forward in everything I've done in my life all the way through today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is, was so important to the success that we had. And uh, how do you, this is a bit off the military topic, but speaking of that, how do you carry that over into the civilian world where the motivations are different? You know, the chain of command is different. I mean, there's similar structures, but the military is obviously very, top down and you people are used to following giving and following orders so how does that carry over in the civilian world that that portion of what you just described i feel like i've been very fortunate in my career i grew up in the infantry in an organization as i just described where i was able to solicit and empower input from the bottom up and I never felt like, and I had commanders who who also valued that, um, you know, commanders like, um, uh, you know, I had a, a first company commander was was a guy named Kevin Beatty. Um, you know, my second one was a guy named Keith Carter, and, and you know, Keith Carter is teaching at West Point now. Um, they were absolutely phenomenal company commanders because they operated from a from a ground up approach. What mattered to them was the input of the of the platoon leaders and the subordinate leaders. Because I had such an experienced platoon, I knew I could value their input and take their input, and that would be impactful. Right. Yeah. And that would help me shape my decision making. Being in special forces also teaches you that. Because there's nothing about 
be there's very little about being in special forces that is about is top down. It the team and the inputs of every member on the team is sought after and valued, and their inputs are taken into the decision making of the of the leadership. When we talk about leadership, hire a hierarchy is put into place in any organization, not so that you can have people who sit there and say, I'm in charge, do what I say. You know, you listen to me. If you've put a hierarchy in place that creates that environment because somebody's been there a certain amount of time or somebody has some certain level of you know, experience, that's not why different levels of leadership exist. Different levels of leadership exist for decision making, right? It's and the decision making is very often based on risk. Now, why are more? I won't say older. I'll say more experienced people put into positions higher up on that hierarchy, right? Because they have more experiences. They might have more knowledge. They might have more education, but what they have are inputs, or we call it effective intelligence. On the podcast, we talk about effective intelligence, the, you, this sum of all the experiences that you've had previously in your life are aggregated now that you can draw on to help you base decisions on for the future. So that comes with time. So you know when you've been around a little bit longer, you've had different experiences, you've You've been involved in different situations. It's not about age. It's just about the things that you've done that correlate to the job that you're being asked to do right now. You could be a very young professional and have had a series of experiences that put you in a position to be at a senior level at a different company. But what happens is you then take those experiences, you apply them to your decision-making based on the risk level that has been given to you and your level within the organization as set by the CEO or the commander or the most senior person who says, I can make any decision in this organization. This level can make decisions up to this point in time. And that could be based on financial risk, you know, financial you know, funds appropriation, meaning that you know up to a million dollars, you can approve over a million dollars. This level has to approve and so on. Or it could be based on reputational risk. It could be based on business risk. You, know, you can name 15, 20 different types of risk that could go into that. And subsequently down the line, everybody says, and this level can make decisions to this level of risk and, and so on. That's why we create hierarchies within organizations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not to just have right. a boss. Right. Right. So yeah, tech, that's always the trick though, uh, is, is getting that, that lower level, not lower level but under the, like you said, the, the, the top leadership to buy in and to, to be comfortable enough to take those risks. I think that's a, it's a point that I hadn't thought about before, but uh, I was thinking back to my own career about, yeah, it is managing risk. That is a good way of putting it. And if you, once you've been through enough, you, you've dealt with risk enough. And so you, you don't get flustered as much, hopefully, and, that, and, and things like that. So I just hadn't heard it uh, put that way before. So it's a good way of putting it, actually. Um, so... Okay, so back to the Army career. Um, first experiences in Iraq. Uh, talk about that a little bit because you're, you're obviously not into your Special Forces career yet. So as a young second lieutenant, uh, talk to me about the first time combat hits you or what your experiences were once you get out of Kuwait. Uh, talk to me about that a little bit. The first firefight that I was in, I was terrified. I mean, ter I am scared out of my mind. I wanted my mom. That was the first thing that went through my mind. Right. You know, like, Hey, I've trained, I'm a, I'm a Ranger qualified infantry platoon leader. I'm ready to go to combat and shoot everybody in the face and, you know, close with and destroy the enemy. And, and rounds come in, you know, that first time it was initiated by a sniper uh, guy in my platoon was hit in the, in the butt and you know, exited out, out, out uh, his like lower leg and kind of groin area. And uh, then that initiated uh, basically a four way ambush. Um, you know, we had, uh, one of my um, squad leaders, guided by the name of Staff Sergeant at that time, Staff Sergeant John Gerald, uh, pulled pulled the wounded uh, Sergeant Munoz to safety in the middle of this you know, four or five way intersection, saved his life at great peril to himself. John later 
lost his life in Afghanistan, but a true American hero, uh, a true inspiration to me, one of my mentors, one of my best friends. But uh, yeah, for the first you know, five, 10 seconds, yeah, I was like, I, don't, I mean, you, you forget about everything that's gone through, through your mind into that training because this thing that you've been waiting for and almost and wanting, in a lot of ways, I wanted to be there and wanted that to happen. Uh, you're asking yourself, what the hell was I thinking? Why am I here? I don't want to be here. But then, but then you got to just, you got a choice. You know, you got to act, you know, you, you, you've gone through the training, you know how to respond to this situation. You trust in the guys around you and then you have to take action. And so for me at that point, you know, it was about saying, Hey, we're going to, we're, we're going to live through this and, and we're going to take action. And so we're going to, we're going to move guys into different positions, uh, you know, and, and respond and bring in aircraft start to you know, start start to defeat the enemy and that's what we uh are you in uh, are you around baghdad at this time outside baghdad where where are you no, i was in a town called oh Balad. you just said Balad. yeah right sorry right yeah so so we operated actually so camp anaconda was a i want to say it was about i don't know 15 15 20 miles or something from the city of Balad, and uh and we were in the town of Balad at a at a fob called fob palawada and that allowed us to operate in the center of that city. Um, and then also on a peninsula called the Deluya Peninsula, which was uh, where the bath party used to go. That's where a lot of them had their okay. houses. So outside of, outside of. So this is um, mostly ex Saddam elements, things like that. Um, bath party people. Um, okay. Yep. And then yeah, you're not, yeah. is this Al Qaeda at the time? Is it all intermixed? What do you, what are you seeing? Yeah, at that time, it wasn't, uh, Al Qaeda wasn't extremely prevalent. Um, that started to come. I mean, we hit Zarqawi um, shortly after, you know, when I, while yeah. I was there. Um, the, it, it was, it was a lot of sectarian mm -hmm. violence. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, Balad itself was extremely Shia dominated. The, the Sunni Ba'ath Party were on the outs, were on the outskirts. And so we had a tremendous amount of sectarian violence between the Sunnis and the Shias that we dealt with. Um, you know, we were a bit of an intermediary, but we were disliked by both sides. <laughs> Until they needed you to do something. Yeah, exactly. Well, we got, you know, we got a lot of tell on your neighbor type stuff, which was hard to, hard to differentiate between that and, you know, real terrorists who were out there, real people who you know sought to do harm, whether it be to Americans or, or the opposite side. Uh, you know, you kind of got a lot of in those rural regions. You get a lot of you know, hey, there's a bad guy in this neighborhood. He lives next door. You know, cool. figure out that like they're just having a dispute over you know, series of crops or or water. This, guy, this or guy's trying like to that. date my sister. Can you take care of him? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's and that's a that's a huge element there as well when you get over into the Middle East. I think I think it draws on your. Uh, Right away, though, you're you're you got your your political si your poli sci and uh, and journalism skills because you're acting as a diplomat as well, and it's that's also a big uh, under seems like an understated, especially once you get into the special forces region uh, area. Uh, you're acting as a diplomat a lot of the time as well. Well, yep. warrior diplomat yep. is the term. So that's and, and that's a really important term, um, and that's something that even when I work with organizations and corporate organizations, I talk about war the. the the purpose of warrior diplomat because warrior doesn't mean that you're a shoot him in the face person you know warrior to me means that you're extremely diligent and you're you're professional that i mean diplomat is part of professionalism too but diplomats more about getting getting along with people seeing perspectives on different sides finding common ground identifying an ability to find a solution that is meaningful and solves everybody's mutual interests. That's about being a diplomat and doing it peacefully. Being a warrior is about having what we've called the relentless pursuit. In the global war on terror, we have the relentless pursuit of to, to root out global terrorism. In a business, you can, in, in even your personal life, you can have a relentless pursuit to achieve your dreams. Okay, have a relentless pursuit to be one of the best podcasts in, in, right, right. out there, right? You know, that's my goal, but that is the warrior spirit. You know, the army called it the warrior ethos. It's the never quit. 
It's the, you know, the characteristics that we talk about on the podcast. It's the drive, resiliency, adaptability, curiosity. You know, there's an element of creativity, emotional strength, effective intelligence, team ability, all these things that make people who make great warriors are not about right. physically fighting against somebody, but they're about achieving the mission no matter the challenge, regardless of what comes your way, you are focused on winning at all costs. That's what a warrior does. Mm -hmm. And then can you be a diplomat on the other side of that, that everybody likes and right. wants to work with? Right, and yeah, it's that, it, it ha and unlike the civilian world or the State Department, you have to be all in one. And that kind of leads to, uh, first off, okay, so how long does this first deployment last? Okay. A year. Okay. Yeah. It was and, you come back home. What is your? Did you did you get a chance to reflect? Were you a different a different person, soldier? Obviously, you are in certain ways, but in what ways do you reflect on that after that year? I wanted to get out. Really? Okay. <laughs> actually, yeah. I actually wanted to get out. I actually said, you know, this, I think there's other things to go do. I tried to like I tried to like branch transfer to the Coast okay. Guard. Cause then this idea, like after I'd been in all these, like these these firefights, and this idea of being a pilot actually was like that's probably, that's probably your dad was idea. your dad was happy, man. <laughs> <laughs> plus, plus I was plus I had uh, plus I had uh, worked a lot with. We were lucky enough to have a, an aviation regiment close, and so we did a lot in helicopters. And so I was actually kind of like, I think this is a good idea. And then the army, I like the army's like, we're not taking any pilots, and then. Uh, I tried to go to the Coast Guard because I was like, you know, I, like the Coast Guard has the best job. Like they fly the best helicopters right. like out there. They have, they live in on the water, on, on the water in the nice, unless you're like ship bound, right? You, you don't if you want to be on a ship. Okay. But if you could get on the Coast Guard and then I was like, well, then I call, I, I like called the recruiter and I was like, I want to do a, a component transfer. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're not the first guy who's, like, tried this. We're like, we've met our, our quota for, like, the next six years. <laughs> I'm like, oh, God. So then I'm like, well, what else can I do? And and, the, and then I was like, well, you have this, this counter-narcotics team in Miami, you know, where I could do, like, you know, drug interdiction on boats. And they're like, oh, yeah, that quota is met for, like, the next four years. I'm like, oh, God. Okay. I'm like, what else can I do? I'm like, okay, I can, I can go be a FBI agent. So then... I started applying to the FBI at the same time I started going to um, applying to selection. And then I went to selection, made it in selection, and was like, well, I made it in selection. I have to stay. I got to go. I got to go to selection. Now I'm there. I made it. I got to go be an SF guy. Like, this was my dream. Get back to what I wanted to do. Uh, you know, stay in the Army, not going anywhere, going to go be a Green I was going to say, that's a, I went to if you're trying to, group. if you're trying to get out, you know, what, what's, what's the deal with going to, because, SF is just taking that up to the highest level. So what was the thinking there? You kind of wanted to get out, but at the same time, you're like, well, because is that part back to the personality of all or nothing? Yeah, I think that the Army does a great job of at every rank of like beating you down in that rank right. and in that job. So the po just to the point where you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. And then they're like, oh, hey, um, if you stay – uh, we're going to promote you and we're going to give you like this cool assignment and open up all these other opportunities for you. What do you think? And you're, and then you're like looking at the pay scale and you're like, Oh, so I'm going to have more years in service and I'm going to go up in rank. So like you're going on like right. diagonally on the pay scale and you're like, or I can go do something else. That I don't know anything yeah. about. Yeah. Okay. I'll stay. <laughs> They're awesome at that. So what, but for this, for, for the idea of getting into selection, does someone, how does that work in sense of, does someone have to put you up, you apply, um, How's that work? Yeah, so so you put in a written packet. Uh, you know, it's like all your records and you know your evaluations and your you know different parts of your official record. And then they review it and they say, okay, yes, yes or no. You, we want you to come to selection. We, they invite you to selection. You go to the three week selection course. If you make it through, even if you make it all the way through, you might not be selected. If you're selected, then uh, then you go to the special forces yep. qualification course. And so, depending on what your what your job is. It's anywhere from twelve the uh, twelve months to twenty four months, you know, based on you know if you're a medic, right. there's like a whole another you know medical training course that you have to go to, which drags it out. But uh, but for me, it was like a year long. At, what was your what was your specific job as an officer? You only have one job, so the only thing you can do is be the detachment commander. 
And, and I, I would argue that if you are a detachment commander and you're trying to do any other job, you're either, you're, first of all, you're wrong and you're not, you're not very good at it, whether you believe you are or not. Right. There's, which is, you always see that on, on teams, like guys who are like, oh, I'm a, I'm a gun guy. So I'm like, I, I could be a weapons guy. It's like, no, not really. There's guys who are trained in that. They went to school for a long time and they're way better than you. <laughs> yeah, great. You know, you're a good shot. Doesn't mean you're a weapons guy. Right. So, <laughs> But that's the only that's the only job. Um, it's it's an eighteen alpha. It's to be the detachment commander, and so your specialty, you know, your focus is on planning, and your focus is on resource allocation, and how do you how do you you know, understand what it is you you're you're being asked to do? How do you break down the different components of what it takes to execute those missions, and whether they be you know, whether they're foreign internal defense, so going to foreign nations and training foreign foreign armies. Uh, and, and equipping them and deploying with them, or whether it's unconventional warfare, um, or whatever it is, you know, direct action, whatever being asked to do, you have to be an expert and be able to plan all those different types of missions, from the most strategic aspect of it all the way down to the most tactical. We're going to enter this room, and this is what's going to happen. And right. so then you got to understand all the resource allocation that goes behind that prioritization of those resources, where they come from, how you get them, and then be able to coordinate interagency and interunit to be able to actually facilitate those operations and then work with everybody below you at your peer level and then all the way up to you know, foreign nations, presidents and senior State Department and military officials. And can you can you work with all those people? Wow. OK, because obviously they're you know, when you get to that level, they're looking for the the warrior as def as you defined earlier. Right. They're looking for all those things that make the relentless drive exist because I've seen whether it was, you know, JTAX or Green Berets or that high, that real high level. It's not always the, the door kickers or the, the star quarterbacks that, that make it through that. Right. And, and um, can you talk a bit about what you saw in Q course and then going forward in that world in terms of what was the next step up in, in mindset, leadership, all that stuff. There's a tremendous amount of autonomy given to special operations and, and specifically, you know, special forces and the green berets, you were selected with some things very high on, on the list, being characteristics, being very high on the list, integrity being one drive being another one, curiosity being another one, because you are asked by and large to go to places that are, in far off lands, um, but that uh, that that you may be the only one mm -hmm. of your uh, uh, Green Beret. You may be the only military official. You might be the only diplomatic official who's going to go to this country or this area. And the expectation is that you're going to understand and complete a mission, and you're going to do it. And you're going to you're going to do it. The reports that you write are going to be true and accurate. The resources that you request are going to be within proper scope, and not you know, are not under or over what's, what's required to be utilized for the mission. Um, and everything you say is going to be taken at face value for the truth, mm. because many times those reports often make it into the president's daily intelligence briefing. Right. If you're the only person in a country and there, and there's something going on, well, the senior most officials in the government may read those reports. So everybody has to believe, everyone has to know that the person who has the utmost integrity is on the other side writing these things mm -hmm. and, and, and solving this problem that the nation has asked them to go solve. And you have to have drive right. because when there's not a lot of you there, it's easy to say, well, I'm going to sit in my hotel room or I'm going to sit in my room or I'm not going to do much today. And so you have to be able to wake up every day and say, I'm going to continue this mission. I'm going to find the answers to the solutions. I'm going to ask the questions that I didn't even know existed mm. to get to a solution that this mission requires. Mm -hmm. And you have to do that day in and day out. And so what you learn when you go to into these roles is that, number one, you're part of something greater than yourself. Right. And it's not about you. No. In fact, I will argue that at times it's enough, not it's too much, not about you, <laughs> <laughs> but that's, but that's the mission that you've been given. And that's a job that you've accepted willingly to, and volunteered to go to. So you learn there's a greater purpose. 
and you learn that every decision that you make can have a strategic impact. Right. And when you carry that forward into leadership and business, you, you, you understand more fundamentally that you operate in you know, almost what I call a four-dimensional space, meaning that you know, your decisions have reciprocal events or, and, and, and repercussions up, down, left, right, sideways, it doesn't matter. In every direction, you can and cannot predict what the outcomes of your decisions may be. Right. And so you have to start to think like that as a leader every single time you sit down to make a decision. But you have to act. Right. No decision is often not an option. Right. Yeah, it, 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 I just, it just... It asks a lot of somebody and it really makes you step up your game into a lot of times guys that are, you know, in their thirties, not in their fifties <laughs> after lifelong experiences and all that you're, you're thrown into it as a relatively young man. Um, and that's what always impresses me about the guys that did your job and in other branches, uh, just how switched on, uh, they're, they are because they have to be, you know, you, you're, you're required so much is required of you. And that's, you know, you're brief, right? The oppressa Libra, you have to be you have to be dropped into an, an, a, a, an indigenous force and sometimes maybe from scratch. And I know you've spent some time in Africa, uh, I think three or four deployments to Iraq. So you've had quite a bit of experience that way. Um, can you talk a bit about the applying that into real world situations uh, where you were sent to Africa <coughs> or wherever to train, train up forces, whatever? The motto of, of the special forces, De Oppresso Liber, means to free the oppressed. Yep. Um, and what, what that, why is that important? You know, it, it's, it's important because it is the driving factor of problem solving, mm. right? We have an inherent right as a human being to be free. And that is something that has existed since the dawn of time. It's the source of it's a source of conflict to this day. That's right. I mean, look at look at what's going on in Russia. That's look right. what's going you know with Russia and Ukraine. Right. Okay, this is about sovereign nation, and this is about freedom of you know individuals and nation states to choose their own future, mm -hmm. choose their own ability to decide who they are and what they want to be. Um, look at what's happening here in the US, uh, you know, we've, we've resurfaced the, the Roe v. Wade abortion debate, mm -hmm. you know, and now the argument about you know, women's free, you know, freedom to choose mm -hmm. is now, you know, being questioned. These are civilizational issues. Okay. And the special forces came to be as an organization under this mindset that their single job, their, their role in the world is to promote freedom mm -hmm. and allow nations, people, individuals, groups of people, countries, whatever you want to call it, the opportunity to choose their own future, mm -hmm. their own direction. Mm -hmm. And that is, and that can be accomplished in a variety of different ways right. through the core mission sets, unconventional warfare, the overthrow of a nation or occupying power, foreign internal defense, training others to solve their own problems right. Right. and equipping them to do so. Seeing that with Ukraine special Direct forces action. right now, like you guys, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're seeing the benefits of the green berets right now. I think I would think with the Ukrainian SF guys. Yeah. D direct action. Yep. Do it ourselves. Okay, there's a number of other missions that they do, but primarily they, they come down to those. So that's why that organization of the, the Green Brace and the Special Forces is the greatest and most dynamic organization in the world. Because there's one simple premise. Because what's the other part about freedom, about freeing the oppressed? It's integrity and doing what's right. And when you wake up every morning and your sole job lives with Deo Preso Liber, I'm going to do what's right for the people that I serve in my country and abroad, then you'll make the right decisions. And when you build organizations, when you build companies that are focused all the way from the organizational, organizational level, all the way down to the individual on doing what's right for the 
company, you will be successful. And that, regardless of where you operate, if that's the guiding theme, that's your central tenet that you abide by every single day, then you will create great organizations that are super successful in anything they set out to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and to the extent that you can, um, now, once you've gotten through this, uh, through your, your deployed as a green beret now, um, do you go back to Iraq? Do you go to Africa? Do you go somewhere else to the extent that you can talk about it? Yeah, I went back to Iraq two more times as a special forces detachment commander. So I went there two more times. Um, and, uh, and then after that, I went to Africa. Um, I went to Djibouti, Africa for six months in uh, 2013. And I, I primarily worked in building partner nation capacity. So I went all around East Africa, identified components of their special operations forces or components of their armies yeah. in East African nations that could be trained as special operations forces to combat Al-Shabaab. And then I served as the assistant operations officer for all of 10 special forces groups, so about 4,000 people across, at that point, four, four continents. And then I was the, then I did the same job in Djibouti in East Africa. I did that in West Africa for a period of time. And then I was the aide to General Jim Linder when he was the SOC Africa commander. So he commanded all special operations in Africa at Special Operations Command Africa out of Germany. And I was his aide. Okay. What's your, uh, give me your impressions from the time East Africa, West Africa. What are some things, doesn't have to be military, doesn't have to be combat related. What are your, what are some things that stuck, stuck out to you? I love Africa. <laughs> cool. And I say it like it's a country, yeah, but, it's, it's, but that's why I love it. Right. Um, I love it because all of our maps are fucked. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, so if you look at a, if you look at a map and you see this massive U.S. and then you look at Africa and the U.S. is like bigger than you know Africa, right, right on the map. Well, actually, like three and a half U.S. Right. fit in right. Africa, right. Um, and uh, and it's and like. I think if you like, actually, you can take like all of the rest of the world, like land masses in the rest of the world, and they like still all fit in Africa. Um, it's absolutely vast, um, north, south, and east, west. It is extremely dynamic. Um, you don't, I don't even know how many countries are in Africa, you know, because one day it will be 54, the next day it'll be 53, the next day it'll be 55. It all depends on like who's having a coup and who's recognized by the international, right. the, the, you know, the, the international audience and, you know, who, who's, ha who has no government today because they, <laughs> right, yeah. and so it's, it's totally wild, um, in a lot of respects. But there's also an absolute tremendous amount of opportunity. Yeah. It is a super young continent, um, something like 70%. I don't remember. And so yep. I don't want to receive any phone calls or nasty notes from people to quote me, but and say I was wrong. But I, it's something like <laughs> greater than 60% or 70% of the nation is under like 25 years yep. old. Or, I'm sorry, the nation of the continent it's like under yep. 25 years yep. old. Um, and there are nations that exceed that. Like at one point, it was like Nigeria was like, 75 or some percent was like under the under 25 years old and, and you have mega cities i mean mega cities like lagos you know i mean you're talking about cities of 25 million people you know to three i mean new york's like eight million people live in new york city like 12 million people live in like within the five boroughs i think are the numbers or something like that or within the area um i mean you're talking about double plus the size of new york city in in square footage that is is actually like i think equal or less so like you have massive amounts of opportunity um the amount of natural resources that are there is absolutely tremendous and untapped and um and you have a population of people who are are getting more and more educated and so what that continent can achieve over the next hundred years, you know, really comes down to how well the rest of the world incorporates them into the global economy. Okay. And do we fear it or do we embrace it? Uh, and then how are the superpowers, you know, as we, as we know, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the first world nations going to begin to interact with each other and fight over right. it, which is the scary part. Right. 
because you're seeing that it's now. already ha- seeing China. Say, it's already happening yeah it's been happening yep. for decades yep. um i mean china you know going all That's in right. on africa right. you know and they're not going all china's not going all in on africa because like they like the african That's people right. and they want to support them they're going all in in africa because they want to extract as much natural resources and have first mover advantage in as many countries as possible That's right and the best way they can do that is by number one investing in the country and building infrastructure so the infrastructure is completely supported by China, and then they can drop thousands and thousands of people there to begin to have a foothold within society and culture. And so it's not, you know, that's a that's a hundred year game that's right. that they're playing. That's right. Absolutely. And so you're seeing that all over Africa. Yeah, and and, and uh, did any country specifically stick out to you as kind of a favorite or a city uh, any, or a or a countryside? Did any, anything stick out to you as a, a kind of thing you'd like to go back to? Yeah, I want to go back to all. Of yeah, right. Um, it's really, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a hard question that I don't think is, is an easy answer because they're all so different. Right. Um, because I've been, I mean, I've been in the Central African Republic, yeah. um, which is like, you know, I mean, that's, that is a, not a super modern place. Right. Um, and that is a, uh, and then, but I've also been to Morocco. Right. Um, which, you know, you can you go to Morocco and you look across the Mediterranean and you can see Spain. Spain, right, <laughs> um, right, right. It's, you know, super, influ- super influenced by, you know, Spanish culture. And I've been to Tunisia and it's super established. And, you know, but I've been to Djibouti yeah. and I've been to Somalia. Yeah, right. um, you know, but I've been to Zanzibar yeah. and, you know, played volleyball in the pool, on the infinity pool on the beach. Right. So, right. you know, I mean, they're all super different. Right, right. Um, I've never been to South Africa, which, you know, kind of sucks because like i always wanted to go to south africa just to go there um uh, but um but it's hard to to answer that question because they're all super different and they all are different places within the life cycle and the evolution and the modernization of the country and so if if you can be appreciative of where they are within that then you can embrace their culture and you can understand their perspective and you can gain so much more out of being there and embracing what they're going through and become a better person from having spent time there. It's a really good way of putting it, man. I spent a lot of time over 25 years off and on in Asia and been to Indi- lived in India a couple of times. And, and man, I just recommend it. Can't recommend it enough uh, to the kids I've coached and been around just be- for that specific reason, because it gives you an education entirely outside of books and an emotional intelligence, hopefully, and just expands you, expands your brain. Uh, it certainly did me. I mean, in, in a certain now, my my uh, my wife would argue it didn't penetrate my thick skull, but uh, in any event, no, I wouldn't trade those those experiences for anything. Be- just precisely because of what you just said, um, because you have to sit down and break bread with people who think totally different than you do, and and like you said, taking cultures and people where they're at, and 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 you know, getting into that mindset is really interesting, and it, to do it in the capacity that you did it is even more maybe intense and interesting too, because security is one of the basis of of culture, you know? The problem that we have as Americans is we get on an airplane and we expect that when we get off the airplane, it's going to be like America. And the first thing that we have to tell ourselves when the airplane door closes is I have to be like them. Wherever I land, I have to adopt their culture in my way. Yeah, right. you know, I'm not saying like, you know, certain things you can't change. I go to India all the time. Like, you know, look, like the reality is, is like, I'm the, I'm, you know, I'm the six, three white guy walking through the town. I don't look at you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but there are cultural norms there that I have to abide by that I have to embrace. And I have to accept that the food is going to be different. The language is going to be different. The accommodations are going to be different. The traffic pattern is going to be different, which if you've been to India, <laughs> certainly is an eye opener. I did experience. rush hour Delhi de- daily for months <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and in Mumbai. So, so yeah. yeah, dude, it's uh, hard it's, to, uh, it's hard to explain well, to, to people who haven't experienced that is, uh, yeah, no, 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 no rules. rules. So, but when you can, when you can approach you know, inter, when you approach your international relations that way, you know, that's what being a diplomat is. You know, that it's it's about going to a foreign land and interacting with a foreign culture and not expecting them to 
adopt your way of life, but adopting their way of life. Right. Yeah. And that's a, it's, I mean, you can only ever be who you are, uh, in, in that sense. It's like you said, I'm not as tall, but you know, I'm a bald white guy that I'm walking around villages in you know, Rajasthan or Gujarat and, and, or in, uh, you know, Asia in Cambodia or Burma or, you know, Laos, and you only are what you are. <laughs> You're going to stand out. But if you can adopt that, I always, I always take it to the level of sharing a drink with somebody or breaking bread with somebody. And if you can do that, not in Gujarat, you're not sharing a drink with anybody <laughs> in Gujarat. <laughs> no, <clears throat> but uh, if you can do that and start out from there, you know you, that's a, that's a good starting point anyway. And and um, so I had a, I have a question I haven't asked before, but I'm curious given what you did. Um, what was your along those lines? You you were in combat situations, training situations in places very different, and along the line of you said you saying about local customs, uh, views of the world, et cetera. How did your concept of good evil, um, and that change, uh, over your time in the service? Like, uh, cause you obviously saw dealt with it extremely in extreme ways in Africa or in, uh, in Iraq and then seeing local customs, which I have before that are sometimes jarring to Western eyes. Um, how did your conception change of that good evil, that type of thing? Or did it remain constant? Did the things your parents taught you yeah. hold you? One, um, <clears throat> one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Right. Okay, so I've heard that, and I've heard and, that saying um, before. Expand on that a little bit. And and you know what we tend to what we tend to believe. Okay, and, and you know, right, right, potentially rightfully so. I'm not saying it's a wrong argument is that when we take you know, 12 guys and we, we kit them up in a whole bunch of you know, uniforms and a bunch of uh, you know, body armor and helmets and night vision and weapons, we put them on a UH-60 Blackhawk helicopter and we drop them into a, a village to go and conduct an operation, that what they're doing is viewed by everybody as an act of freedom or by, as good as an act of let's say it's let's say it's an act of good okay well what about the people on the other side right people on the other side who are we we're the ones who are crawling through the roadside digging a ditch in the middle of the road and planting a roadside bomb and waiting for somebody to drive by so we can mm -hmm. blow them up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so to them, we're doing the same thing they're doing. Right. We're just doing it differently because we're, we're better. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> but, no, better at it. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. we're America right. and we can. Um, but, but that at the end of the day is what's that. I mean, it, the perspective of good versus evil is all in in the eye of the, the side that you sit on. You know, I mean, look at what's happening yep. in Russia. Yep. You know, I'm, and I'm not saying the Russian people agree with this. I mean, I've talked to a lot of Russian people, and they don't agree with this. You know, but but there are people who who agree with it. I mean, they're delusional. You know, I've listened to people like, in here that <clears throat> are openly taking you know Russia's Putin's view of this. Yeah, and have. have found ways to blame everything. So, and I'm, again, we can get into that. I'm happy to, it's just, and I have my own views and you have your own views, but it's your, to your point, it's, it's really, uh, it's really been interesting to see people's justifications either for or against what Putin's doing and how people. It all, it all depends on the side that you sit on. If you sit on, if, if you sit on a certain side of an issue, then the other person is a terrorist and you, you are a freedom fighter who's doing everything in your power to make your way the con the 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 general populist way, right, right, it and I think and I think that's what you learn, you know. I, I think that's that's what you learn, you know. I mean, and and you you look at it and you say, you know, we're very fortunate in this country, you know, with uh, barring some thing that they haven't even made a movie about, you know, except for like the <laughs> zombies, right? World War Z. Like no one's invading. Yeah, no, no one's invading the U.S. Okay, like destruction of the U.S. is going to come from internal. Hundred percent. If it, you know, if ever. Okay, 
It's not, no other country is coming to the U.S. to invade the U.S. But are you going to tell me that if somebody did and they came to your neighbor house and fast roped onto their property and detained your neighbor, that you're not going to grab your guns and your safe and go out and hide in the road and shoot 100%. at them when they leave? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. You know? And did that, uh, how did, how have you, since those experiences and those kind of realizations, revelations, how have you, you know, kept your compass, your moral compass, or how have you grappled with that and, and, and things that you did that way? Well, look, when you're there, regardless of how you feel, you have to make a choice, right? You know, you're going to kill them or they're going to kill you. It's an ideological battle. And, the, and honestly, the ideology, the ideology doesn't matter. Okay, what matters in that moment is that I'm here to, to save the life of those who, have, who I serve with at all costs. Mm -hmm. And secondary to that is achieve the mission. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so, uh, so you have to become very binary in that thought process when you're, when you're, especially as a ground force commander, you know, which is a very, very difficult role to be a ground force commander because you have to make choices you have to make choices on resource resource allocation. Are you going to save lives? Or are you going to defeat the enemy? You know, what are you going to do to save lives, defeat the enemy, and achieve the mission? And so you have to. So, you, but but it but you have to think like that. So it becomes a binary thought process. You know, when you're in that <coughs> when you're in that moment. Um, but I think that you you know that you you have to then. You know, it shapes you, you know, like it, it shapes you to think about a more worldly view of things. Um, but you cannot let that thought process consume you. You know, I mean, what what are we in? You know, I mean, look, you have to, if you, if you elevate that thought process, right, and you elevate that thought process into where we are today strategically, you know, in the world, you know, are we in a battle of, of good versus evil? You know, well, I would argue, yes, we are. Mm -hmm. We are. Um, and, and good will prevail, you know, it will take time. It will be painful. It will be unnecessarily painful for all of us. Um, cause I think there are ways to, to mitigate some of the things that we're experiencing here. Uh, but we, we have to preserve world order. Okay. And the world order will modify and change like it, 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 it will, but at the end of the day, you know, America is an idea. America is a thought. America is a place. You know, the United States is a place. America is an idea. And it is an idea of freedom. It's an idea of liberty. Okay. And it is a idea of Deo Preso Liber, free the oppressed. This is where people from all over the world want to come because they believe in America and the idea behind America. Our job and the world's job is to preserve mm. America and preserve that idea, that shiny city on a hill that Re President Reagan talked about. If that goes away, the world order crumbles into chaos. So there, there are still bad people who want to do bad things to you, regardless of, of what you think, right? And whether you, you're a person who wants to give hugs to everybody and throw money at everybody and appease them and hope that the problem goes away, okay? Or you're on the other side and you think all we should do is shoot people in the face and become insular and not talk to anybody and solve our own problems, right? The truth's in the middle. Yep. You know, we got to do both those things. I know we have to do both those things in less extremes, we don't need to be throwing money at everybody. We don't need to be giving everybody hugs. We need to be a little bit more diplomatic in how we deal with people. But we need to be willing, capable to violently execute and solve problems across the world. Because when we're not, when we don't, when no one understands or fears that America will impose its will and can impose its will when and if it has to, the world order will change. 
and not to our liking. And, and, and what people are failing to understand is that when the world order changes, it will become very ugly for freedom across the world. And you can still have, you can still have freedoms at home. We can still become an inclusive culture. We can still embrace different perspectives and different ways of life. Okay. And we can still have women's rights and we can still embrace ethnic minorities and we can still have diversity and inclusion and equity. And we can still have a culture in which everybody has a voice that we embrace because that makes us stronger. But we can still do so by being a warrior who goes out there and the world understands that we will never let freedom be challenged and we will never let our position in the global economy, in international relations, across the components of what, what we call, you know, the, the, the national elements, the elements of national power, dime, you know, diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. America has to lead across those fronts. Yep. You can't lead from behind. This no. whole concept about lead from behind is bullshit. Yep. Yep. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. Uh, that, yeah, that's anyway, on a, on a, on a minor level, it's like letting a bully take your lunch money over and over and over again. And it's a piece if you, if you hide in the bathroom, it's going to go away. It, it didn't work for me and it didn't work. It doesn't work on the world stage either. Yeah. Very well said though, by the way, man, I've, I've it's interesting to hear that that perspective from someone who's kind of done the warrior diplomat thing, both sides. Um, so, okay, uh, take me through kind of towards the end of your your career. Um, did you did you know you were going to get out when you got out? Because you did, you know, you didn't do a full twenty years or what they would say a full twenty years is. So, what was your thinking there? Did you did you want to get out? Was it a medical issue? Did you what was going on there towards the end of your career? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, eventually you think, you know, when your time comes up and, you know, I, I certainly wanted to stay and, but my family, you know, my wife and daughter had you know, moved to New York and, you know, we, we were at that point no, no longer together. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it was a difficult decision to try to, you know, continue to pursue a military career or try to figure out, was I going to, you know, try to go be, be more of a dad and, you know, didn't really know at that point what would happen with, with my marriage or if that would stay together or what we would do. But, you know, it's kind of like I knew what the army had was going to, was going to have over the course of the next you know couple of years and what that would look like. And, you know, there were other priorities that kind of came up. And so I said, well, that's it. Let's go do something else. And gotcha. Realized that I lacked a tremendous amount of skills. Um, yeah, I had a tremendous amount of skills, uh, soft skills. I did not have any, hard skills in terms of, uh, I didn't know what a balance sheet was or an income statement or marketing or business strategy. And so it made it very difficult to get a number of jobs that I really wanted. Um, cause I would talk about, they'd say, well, tell me a time where you, you know, led something. And I'm like, well, there was this crazy time where I got sent to Nigeria right after you know, 200 right. schoolgirls got kidnapped. And I oh, remember like Michelle Obama held a, you know, held up a sign, you know, save the girls, the and, you know, and like, then I was in Nigeria and I was sitting there with like a French guy and a British guy and a bunch of Nigerian generals. And they were like, we don't have a problem with Boko Haram. Like I let, you know, I was, I was there and they're like, uh, we don't know what to do with you. Do you know what a balance sheet is? I was talking is? about an office. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, do you know what a PL is? I'm like, uh, no. I'm like, oh, okay. Disqualify. <laughs> so you're not, right. you're not capable of leading. Like, okay, so I need to figure out how I'm going to close this gap. So I figured, uh, best army sends you to school every time they promote you. Um, yeah. or put you in a new job. They send you to a school, give me a core set of academic skills. And then from there, you got to figure it out. And I said, well, I better go to business school. Um, so I applied to NYU. I got in and I went to okay. NYU and got my MBA. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. 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 I didn't know that, but I didn't know that part. All right. Yeah. Yeah. At BU, NYU, that's a little bit better than my uh, community college experience in the initially. So you're, <laughs> you're ah. you got, you got, <laughs> in a lot of ways, it's a piece of paper. It's just an expensive <laughs> one. No, no, it definitely is that. Um, Okay, so you get into your own company. Um, let's get to the Jedberg. First of all, tell me the the name because I like the I, I love the the meaning behind the name. And then 
why did you want to start your own show? Yeah, all that. Get into that. Yeah. Because I want to be Tom Brokaw. I already told you that. <laughs> yeah. no. well, Brokaw. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, um, I, no, I, you know, look, I, I really, you know, I figured one day I'd always kind of try to figure out a way to jump back into journalism. Um, yeah. When I was sitting um, at my mom's house uh, during COVID, because we had had a baby, we had an apartment in New York City. And, uh, you know, after about two weeks of sitting in an 800 square foot apartment with a, at that point, a 10 year old who couldn't go to school and, you know, a newborn and a dog and a room and a half. It was like, we got to go. Um, my company had shut down uh, during COVID. The investor pulled all funding. So I, I was out of a job um, and I was looking around going, what do I do? Um, and, then, and then I said, I should write a book. And then I talked to a friend of mine from high school and they said, well, you should start a podcast. You like to talk. And then I said, well, what the hell would I talk about? And then I was like, well, I kind of like. I'm still paying for this journalism degree that I have <laughs> from, from 2003. So I might as well figure out how to use this thing. And so I started coming up with this concept of the of podcast and what would I talk about? And I said, oh, I want to talk to super influential people across a variety of different things. I didn't want to be a professional veteran where I only yep. talked to veterans. You know, I had been an athlete in college, but I'm not a professional athlete. Um, I was okay in college. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and then I said, well, if I create a podcast, I'm going to talk to super influential people around a variety of things. And what would I name it? And I toured us some names. And then I was like, you know, the Jedbergs. Like, Jedbergs, okay. What's the lineage of the special forces? It's the Jedbergs. Who were the Jedbergs? The Jedbergs were a transformative organization in World War II that were put together in the midst of chaos in which the war was by and large going to become a failure unless we, the allies invaded France to unseat Germans who were occupying France. But the only way to do that was through the Normandy invasion, which was a death trap due to superior entrenched German machinery and weaponry. And so we had to create an organization on the allied side that could defeat the Germans at all costs. Mm -hmm. And the way they would do that would be to parachute into occupied France starting the night before D-Day in three-man teams with one mission. Find the French resistance, arm and train the French resistance, do whatever it takes to prevent the Germans from reinforcing the beaches at Normandy. Hmm. And uh, that organization, after World War II, went on to become the operations director of the CIA, and then they subsequently, many of those individuals who were on those Jedbergs, Jedberg teams, um, went on to become the first U S army special forces and the green berets. And that was the lineage that I saw was the tie back from me being a green beret back into the Jedbergs, being this organization that transformed the world. And I said, I'm going to interview modern day Jedbergs in whatever their industry is and tell their stories. And then I was partnered with the talent war group and Mike Sorelli and they had just written the talent war, released the book. They used the nine components of the nine characteristics of performance as defined by special operations command. And I said, we can tie that into these stories. We can talk about how special operations mindset is what, there are components and character that are involved in that mindset that allows people to be successful. We'll tell the stories of our guests through that lens and we'll take it and expand from there. And that's what we've done over the last year and a half. And it's been an awesome, exciting man. No, it's a great... return to what I always wanted to do. And no, it's a great show. And I, and I also, you know, I, I really enjoy it. I'll put the link in the show notes so people can come, come find you a whole bit, but um, it just seems like you're, you know, probably you couldn't have, I like to think anyway, I, I couldn't have done this and maybe you couldn't have done that at an earlier age coming fresh out of college without having the experiences that you have. And you have to go through that to be what you are, you know, that kind of is an obvious statement, but it has, it adds meaning to me later in life because, you know, you have stuff to talk about. You have experiences that you can draw upon. And as you've been eloquently doing for the last hour or so, you know, and, and, uh, you had to go through what you get to, to get to the Jedberg now. And I love the name, by the way, it's, it's, uh, if I could resurrect those initial guys, I've read a ton about them and interview all of those guys for the next five years, I would be happy, <laughs> you know? Yeah. A truly, a truly impactful organization. A lot of people don't know about it. Um, we did an episode on it. Episode 15 was with, uh, 
Colin Bevan. Colin Bevan is an author. He wrote it. His grandfather was a Jed Berg. He wrote a very, very, probably the most comprehensive book about, about Operation Jed Berg. Um, you know, there's a few out there, three or four different versions, but probably the most comprehensive one was Colin's book. Um, I don't think it gets the credit that it deserves, um, but, uh, but you should check it out. It's really, really, really cool. fascinating. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do. And it was a great episode we'll with him, too. And we tied it. Yeah, exactly. All sorts of other stuff. I saw, I, I actually started, I started listening to that and then had something else come up, but I yeah. still have it downloaded on my, on my thing. So I'll get to that for sure. Um, and then, you know, going forward, obviously you travel a lot, you're an entrepreneur, the whole bit. Um, what is the talking to these people? If, if, if you're anything like me talking to you, talking to guests, it, I come away from it every time inspired, kicking my ass a little bit. Um, you talk to some very high level people in terms of in business and in the civilian world, sports, whatever, what does that show do for you? Uh, you know, the, sh the, the show motivates me. Um, I interviewed Harris Glazer. Harris Glazer is the owner of a company called Midnight Express. They make million dollar power boats down in Miami. Um, and he said, an entrepreneur, you know, you're, you know, you're an entrepreneur or something. It's, I won't get the exact quote right because it's been a bit, but, but he said, it's the, it's the first thing you think about when you wake up and it's the last thing you think about when you go to bed. Um, and that's, that's so true. Uh, so true for me um, with, with, I think with everything that I do, but you know, this, this holds a special place in my heart um, and a passion for me because it's, it's what I always envisioned myself doing, you know, when I was, when I was younger, um, it gives me the opportunity to learn from so many people. I'm so, so fortunate to have the network that I do and the support that I have in this, in, in this endeavor, Jersey Mike's and Peter Cancro, the CEO of Jersey Mike's have been extremely supportive of us. They are, they're our title sponsor. Um, they've made it happen. Peter was our, was our first guest really outside of the talent war guys, Mike and George. Um, so he, you know, Peter was, and from day one has been a tremendous supporter and I couldn't be more thankful, um, to them. And we're actually going to be doing a couple of episodes later this year, uh, a little bit more on, on Jersey Mike's and some of the mm. things that they're doing out in the community. Uh, and I couldn't be more thankful for the people who have come in to support, to support me, um, and support me, you know, and not only the team with our, our production coordinator, Jenny Duclay has been, who's been a friend of me and my family. And she's in, you mentioned sail ahead. Her brother started sail ahead. So know her right. since she was about 12 years old, um, and very close with her family. And, you know, she came on and said, you know, I want to, I want to try to support this as best I can. And she's been absolutely awesome. We've taken on a PR, we partnered with Boston University um, to be part of their internal student-run um, public relations uh, agency um, called PR Lab. And so they've been awesome. And so uh, we had a really great group of students who worked with us last semester. I look forward to the next one this coming semester. But we've brought on uh, Steph. Steph has come on as a PR um, coordinator. Uh, so she just graduated and we offered her the you know, opportunity to come work with us. Um, we have a, we have a full-time video editor. Um, but until a couple of months ago, I was doing everything. Um, say, so it's, a lot it's, of been work, a, dude. it's been a relief, um, <laughs> to bring them on, uh, cause I have another, a, a number of other initiatives, which you know, occupy my time. And it was, I was getting tired of sleeping like two, two and a half hours a night. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but super rewarding, you know, to, to answer your question, I, I absolutely, I'm so thankful to all of my guests. Um, we continue to to have a tremendous lineup coming up through the end of this through the end of this year. Really, is what we're I mean, we're almost booked every week um, through the end of this year, and we've started releasing some weeks two episodes, um, short form and a long form, and we're trying to become a bit more dynamic. We just released new music, um, yeah. so we have a new theme song. So a lot, so a lot of hard it. work with partnering with Ian McGlynn, who wrote our who wrote and composed our first track. Um, and so now we're, we're spicing it up a little bit. Um, so I set up a bunch of playlists and I was like, I need to feel like this. And so now I've been, you know, been, been pestering here. I think he's done a phenomenal job, um, on the new sound, on the new soundtrack. And so we're super excited about that. And, um, and the go rock games was, was absolutely huge for us. And so we're going to release a trailer, um, uh, from the, from the go rock games here in a couple of days, um, where we have a recap, uh, which is you know, awesome. Uh, and then we're, then we, we got a couple more events coming up this year. So we're, we're finalizing the details. I can't talk about them yet. 
Um, but we're going to do three or four more you know, big on, on-site events later on this year. And it's going to continue to, to um, I think, you know, redefine what podcasting can be. You know, I think we can, you know, I think we can have a podcast that is a media outlet and allows us to do dynamic things. And these on-site recordings, I think, are, are tremendously impactful. Uh, and I think it changes the whole vibe of it. And it allows us to to really become a uh, to to become a media outlet that can cover a variety of different things. Put it into a podcast form. We are up on YouTube. All of our videos. We're doing like three camera sets now mm-hmm. on all of our videos. So if you haven't seen our YouTube channel, check it out. We suck on YouTube. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to crack the algorithm. It, code i cannot it's beating me down so if you like to watch videos and you want to see what we're doing go on youtube comment because comments change the algorithm um, and subscribe and that would be absolutely awesome well you'll just so you know you'll your your mug and unfortunately my mug will be the first i'm going to read it get get the youtube channel going you're my first video yeah. uh, so <laughs> good yeah, I yeah, know how that, I've, I've been <laughs> i've been looking at that too so it's you're gonna feel my pain real soon <laughs> oh, God. no doubt about it man um we'll have like tens of thousands of downloads on yeah. like you know on 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 the podcast platform and i'll go to youtube and it'll be like four and I'm like, oh, oh, oh my God, like this is, this video is awesome. I mean, it's all the work it's, that goes into it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like there's, there's hours, there's tens of hours, like 20 hours have gone into creating this video and like four. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> laughing at you. I'm laughing with you because I have the same problem. I know. <laughs> Be- oh, dude, I know it so well. I know it so well. Instagram's you know, it's just- the same thing. Like we'll, like we'll, like we'll post on Instagram and like this just happened. Like to while we're sitting here, my phone's been going off. I don't know if you can hear it the whole time. Like right. two days ago, we released a post, like fourteen thousand views. Yeah. In like minutes. Like minutes, right. like fourteen thousand views. That's real. Yesterday, basically the same content. Hundred and eighty seven. <laughs> Today, like fourteen thousand views. Yep. Yep. I'm like, I, what? is going on <laughs> it's the machine it's the algorithm machine man it's I, i'm not you got it's it's sort of those things you just do it because you love it because if you pay attention to that stuff you'll you'll end up well you still have your hair you'll end up like yeah me. it's still it's still here it's just a little messy so I had... no 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 but at least it's there you have a defined hairline yeah. unlike me i'm going for the broke ass <laughs> jason statham jean luc picard go. look man <laughs> so um well cool man i before we go i just want to i always ask this question uh looking back on your army career um, what are, you know, obviously we all have regrets, but are there anything, any things that you would have done differently? And what are you most proud of in terms of, uh, that portion of your life? I wouldn't do anything differently. Um, because you learn from every experience that you have good and bad. And I don't think we can look in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, if you look in the past and I mean, sure, there's a lot of things you look at and go, well, you know, maybe I would have not said that, you know, or I would have, you know, you know trust me, there's a lot of times where I should have kept my mouth shut. Um, you and me both, brother. <laughs> you and me but, both. but I, you know, look there, there's, I, I don't think, I don't think you, you can't, you can't look backwards. Um, you know, I mean, I've been open about, you know, a lot of things in my personal life that, you know, I was you know, pretty shitty about and, you know, really, I mean, should have, you know, really, in all honesty, you know, should have you know, led to my wife and I, you know, permanently being you know, apart. Um, and, it, you know, it never, it never got there. Uh, but that's a credit to her, not me. I did, you know, basically everything in my power to make sure we did, we, ne- we, we did go there, but, you know, but we, you know, that has all worked out for the better Thank now. God, yeah. Um, thankfully. Uh, but I wouldn't be who I am if I hadn't had those experiences and if I hadn't done that and you know, is it fair? No, um, no, it's not. Um, but are we better, you know, for it? Yeah, probably. Right. You know, and, and, and so do I look back and say, you know, what I've done something different? I don't know because you know, life comes, life's like a football game. You know, I mean, there's a lot of plays in a football game where you're like, well, you know, 
if you know if we had done that this would have changed you know but really like you know super bowls come down to like two plays yeah. you know by and large like two three plays and if they had been different you know would it change the entire trajectory of your of, of everything yeah um you know i think life's the same way you know you can always look back to one two three things that are in your life and you're like well if i had done this differently would i have where would I be today? But then there's like I talked about that four dimensional space and decision making. Yeah. Okay, well if I hadn't done that, would I be doing this today? No, right. I wouldn't. Right. And is this? Am I doing today what I want to do? You know, am I a chief people officer and doing what I want to do? Yes. <clears throat> do I run the podcast and that's my passion? Yes. And did I just launch a leadership development program, a team building program with a national gym franchise in retro fitness? Yeah, we just did that. You know, like, I would not have any of these things if I went back and I said, well, I should have done this differently. Yeah, right. um, 100%. I think the most, what am I most proud of in my military career? Yeah. That, that's what you asked me. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, look, I, I think, I, I think, I think we're working hard. Hmm. You know, it's easy to say, you know, sure. Yeah. I was a Green Beret, you know, I was an honor graduate at Ranger School and in the Q course. Those are all achievements, but those achievements are not in a vacuum. You know, those achievements are not without others. Um, they're not without hard work that came from me and other people that allowed us to be successful in training, in combat, in everything that we set out to do. Um, those were team, you know, don't do anything yourself. Uh, right. But what I can say is that everything I did, I did to the best of my ability. Mm. Mm. And I think that benchmark is the most important thing that builds great individuals and organizations. When people say, what's your standard? Mm -hmm. The standard is the best I can. Mm. Because that's what closes the gap between what you perceive it takes to win and what it actually takes to win. And too many times we get into a situation where we're like, I think if I work this hard, I'll win. And then we work that hard and we don't win because it actually took something greater. Mm -hmm. But if I give every, everything that I have every single day, no matter what, to the best of my ability, the result will justify itself. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm most proud of the fact that every single thing I did I did to the best of my ability. Yep. And then you can be regret free. Yeah, that's right. Live with them. Um, and then before we go, any organizations, we mentioned sale ahead, um, vet organizations or otherwise that you want to mention, uh, and I'll put these in the <coughs> notes as well, but anything you want to mention that way? Yeah, I mean, I could I could go on, um, but yeah, no, check out. I mean, certainly check out Sale Ahead. Um, you know, Sa Sale Ahead, great organization. We got an event coming up here at the end of July. Um, we teach veterans how to sail as a as an alternative means to therapy for mental health. Um, there's a power in the water that disassociates yourself. We just recorded an episode this week. It'll release in about two weeks. Um, it will release. Uh, it'll be episode 68 with Dawn Riley. Um, she's one of the, if probably the most famous female sailor ever. Um, you know, first, first women to compete in the America's cup, won the America's cup in 1992. Um, now is super instrumental in developing the next generation of leaders around sailing, but great conversation with her, um, about that, uh, and sail ahead. Um, also, uh, Green Beret Foundation, um, you know, big, 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 big supporter of the Green Beret Foundation, um, big supporter of the, uh, special operations warrior foundation, um, who is also partnered with us on the podcast. Um, and, uh, you know, special shout out to, uh, like I said, Jersey Mike's our title sponsor, you know, analytics, my company, um, 18 alpha fitness and Kevin Edgerton, um, and, uh, and retro fitness, who's I'm now partnered with on this leadership development program. And, uh, we're going to get BU rowing back on the metal stand. That's it. I see yeah. that. It's all, all my plugs. Check out the Jed Bird podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll put that first and then we'll go down the uh -huh. line, dude. Yeah. So, hey, friend, thank you so much, man, for your time. Really enjoyed this conversation, dude. Seriously, I, I, I got a lot from it and I'm go back and listen to it while I edit it and get more from it because uh, you had some some really, really good, good in your experiences have led you to really think deeply on this stuff. And uh, and uh, and I'll continue to enjoy your podcast, man. I, I'm, I'm subscribed and, and listen. 
All right, I appreciate it. Hopefully you can uh, edit out some of the coughing and hacking over here that I had because I'm still battling this COVID thing, which is which is not cool. So, not cool but appreciate you having me on. This has been a great time. Yeah, well, I finally got my got my shit together. I apologize for those that we tried this once before, and I didn't have my shit together, so we had to reschedule. It friend, friend was cool enough to uh, to to work with me, so I appreciate. I it. I had to re-record an entire episode with a senior government official, so I get it. <laughs> awesome, man. All right, well, best of luck, man, and I'll uh, I'll I'll look forward to, to to talking to you down the line too, man, because I, I really really enjoyed the convo, man. All right, thank you. Thanks, man.